All right, so I am excited for these two chapters. Uh, They are great. They are great. So we are on our second to last Sunday looking at Nehemiah. And when I kind of settled on teaching Nehemiah for the beginning of of 2018, I thought, you know, we'll just kind of like power through it pretty quick. Um, But then now I'm like, this is actually so good. And I really regret going through it with such a fast pace. Um, But the schedule's already made and we can't. So I just want to say, enjoy this as much as you can, because this is the second to last Sunday that we're going to have uh, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah before we ramp up towards our preparation uh, for Easter week. Um, and so um, today's, uh, today's um, sermon is titled, uh, Forget Me Not. And there's a, a great um, focus that we'll see uh, both in chapter 11 and in chapter 12 on remembrance on people choosing to consciously remember things. Um, And so as we have that kind of in our mind, as we're thinking about the idea of remembering, um, I just want you to to maybe think back to something uh, historically or some interesting like local history. Um, I want to talk about... Is there the, the ship manifest list that made it? All right. One day, one day, one day we'll get it. One day we'll get it. So imagine with me, if you will, <laughs> the Titanic's um, passenger list. Imagine the, the, the filing and the, the old-timey writing. And on that list is uh, 2,223 names. Uh, the names are, you know, primarily uh, British names, but I think there's uh, something like... Uh, 150 or so um, Irish names, uh, people that came from Ireland that that signed up for that um, fateful uh, trip uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, Those names of lists, they were divided into three categories, well four technically, Uh, first class, second class, third class, and then there was was crew. Um, And the rich and famous, uh, the you know, high and mighty, uh, the stowaways, I don't know, Jack, whatever his name, um, <laughs> who's actually not a historical character, just want to throw that out there. Um, but, but from the highest to the lowest of society, each of them had their name uh, put down uh, in that book. And we're, we're interested in that, perhaps more than we would be any other list of names, uh, because we know that those names, they have a story behind them, that they're connected to real lives and real families, uh, and that for some of them there's even a, a cork connection. Um, as, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, the last stop of the Titanic was at what we call Cove now, but it previously was called Queenstown. Queenstown. Yeah, and so uh, technically it didn't, it didn't dock in Cove because uh, it was too big, but it, it stayed outside and then there was um, ships going, uh, small boats going back and forth, dropping off passengers and posts uh, to be brought uh, over to America. And in fact, the very last photo um, that exists, that's extant of the Titanic, is taken uh, from, from Cove. And it could have been, it could have been there, it could have been there if only I had uploaded the files properly. Um, but so on that list, you know, there's, there's names from, from our city. There's people from Carrig Navarre. Uh, there's people from Glanmire. There's people from Blarney Street. There's, there's Cork people whose names uh, were on that list. And so we're, we're intensely interested in, in a, a list of names. Uh, and so... Are you excited? Because today we're going to look at a list of names. Uh, in, in, a chapter, in chapter 11 and chapter 12, uh, they, there's other things that take place, but it's mostly a, a list of, of names. And, and so we're going to see some of the significance um, of those names because I, I believe that as we have with even that Titanic list in our mind, we know that's important to us because those are real people with real lives and they have real families and that's connected to even us in Cork. I believe this list of names that we're going to be looking at, that is also real people with real lives and it also has connection to us in Cork in 2018. Um, so today I, we're going to see the, the big idea of our passage is that God doesn't forget the work of his people. And then simultaneously, God's people 
do not forget the work of their God. So God is the one who remembers our work, and then we're called to be those that are consciously in remembrance of God's work. And so let's, let's pause, let's pray, and then let's look at uh, some of these verses in chapters 11 and 12. So Father, it's um, wonderful to, to sing your praise, to have our voices just kind of join in with other people um, and honor you vocally. I pray, Father, that as we look at these chapters, that it can be for us um, our daily bread um, for the day, that it would encourage us, Lord. It's a, a message of encouragement, I think. And for those that are particularly discouraged, Lord, would you just like shine your, your heavenly floodlight on them, Lord, and, and bring encouragement um, this morning. Uh, thank you so much, Lord, that, that you have worked and that we're able to recall it, Lord, in the ancient past and even as far as like yesterday or earlier this morning, we know that you've been at work. Help us to be those that are not forgetful. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, chapter 10 is largely about uh, the work of God's people. Uh, and so that's the first half. Um, God's people working. That's what we see in uh, chapter, oh, chapter 11 and 12. Sorry, I've been, I've been mispronouncing it. I'm not mispronouncing it. I've been wrong. Um, chapter, not 10 and 11, but chapter 11 and 12. It's an accent thing. That's why I... <laughs> Um, so as we come to chapter 11, uh, let me just read the first two verses. That kind of sets the stage before the, the list of names comes. Uh, in, in 11 verse 1, it says this. Now, the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring out one of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of the ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. So th this chapter starts with Jerusalem um, fortified, uh, rebuilt from the ground up and from the walls in. Or I should say actually from the temple outwards. Because the temple was rebuilt first as a, as a display of um, priorities and values. And then it, out from there, Nehemiah finished what Ezra started by building the walls to surround the temple and the city. And so the problem that we see, if you can read verses 1 and 2, what you see there is that the city is rebuilt. Um, the walls are like brand shiny and new. But it's, it's kind of like a, like a ghost estate. At this point, do you, do you remember the, the ghost estates from a few years ago? Or maybe they still exist. In fact, I think that some of them still do. Um, these houses that were built, these whole estates, rows and rows of houses, with the anticipation that surely someone will buy them. And then the economy tanked and people stopped buying houses. And so there's these ghost estates, these places built for people to live in and to enjoy that just degraded and you know squatters and just vandals have um, just turned them into what we call now as as ghost estates well um, Israel Jerusalem the capital of Israel is it's rebuilt but we see there's only a tiny fraction of people that actually want to live in it um, we can look at um, Ezra chapter 7 verse 4 um, which gives us kind of the state of play it says that the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. So that's, that's the situation. So in chapter 6, the wall was complete. And then in chapter 7, you can kind of see Nehemiah be like, man, I'm so glad that this vast empty wasteland now has a wall around it so that it's nice and safe. And, and so you can see maybe the gears are, are turning. I think the fact that it's, that it's noted right after the wall is finished, he notes the fact, well, there's actually nobody living in this place, that, that it's starting to go. But then in chapter 8, maybe you recall, in chapter 8, this like revival starts amongst the people. 
Um, so there is this like physical safety with the wall being completed, uh, but then God does what only God can do, which is just bring life to the heart of people that, that have had just this like dead religion or whatever. All of a sudden, God's word comes to play. And then Ezra just stands up and reads from scripture, and it's, what it's doing, it's like, it's breaking people's hearts, it's causing them to realize their sin, and then he's encouraging them to look to the Lord for, for grace, and then saying, you know, God's called us, you know, to feast and to celebrate, and so this, like, this party of obedience takes place. There's the festival of booths, and booth, booths, booths, not boots, um, that was an accent thing, um, there's this festival and people are celebrating and feeding one another and those that have food are providing for those that don't. And chapter 8 is this wonderful just like revival that breaks out. And then in chapter 9, the revival continues to break out, but it changes tone. It goes from this celebratory feast to also a time of just, you know, heart-rending repentance and prayer and confession. And so we see that this is taking place um, and then now in chapter 9, I don't want to say that the revival has um, died down, but, but we see that the, the hearts are changed. And then Nehemiah is like, okay, well, we need to get back to what we're doing. We're, we're here to have enlivened hearts and real relationships with God. But also, like, my job is to, like, build this city. And you guys aren't helping <laughs> by living out in the suburbs. We need people to, to move in. So the city at this moment, it is... Um, there's this commitment to righteousness um, amongst the people, but now they need kind of an urban planner. <laughs> so Ezra is there calling them to repentance, and then Nehemiah is there being like, okay, let's get some urban planning going on. Let's, let's move people in here. He's saying the city is secure. The wall has been complete. It's safe. The gates have been rebuilt. He's saying it's sanctified because the temple's in working order and the people have their hearts soft before God. And he says all that we are missing is people living there. He's asking people to invest their lives and to move in and to relocate and to rebuild. Because look, there's, there's not a lot of houses there. It's kind of like a ghost estate with no houses. So it's just like this ghostly plain. And he's like, I want you to leave your comfortable house in the suburbs. Come into the city. Establish your family in this city. Again, another contemporary example. Um, the Elysian Tower. Where is that? Is that like that way, right? I think it's just over there. Um, I remember when it was built. I remember when it was completed back in 20, 20, uh, 2007. It was completed in 2007. And then it has been largely um, empty or various degrees of empty between 2007 and December of 2017. So again, another one of those like poorly planned or unfortunately planned building projects where there's this giant luxury apartments that were built, again, the economy tanks, and then nobody moved into it. It was this vast, empty, luxury apartment sky rise, and it wasn't until December of 2017, like two and a half or three months ago, that they had this party because everybody moved in. It was actually in the Irish Examiner that, that finally... 211 apartments were now finally occupied. And so Nehemiah is like, okay, we have the city. Who wants to come occupy it? And then in verses 1 and 2, which we've already looked at, or read anyway, we see that the, the leaders, they already live there. You know, Ezra and the boys, Nehemiah, they already live there. And they're inviting others to come join them. And so it looks like in, in chapters 1 and 2 that maybe there's these two different options, um, that there's this like lottery system um, to kind of maybe whittle down the volunteers. Uh, but what I know especially is that verse 2 is really plain. It says that there's this like celebration. There's this blessing of those that willingly offered to come and to live in Jerusalem. And so they're saying like, we see you, we thank you, we bless you. Thank you for leaving your comfortable life to come start over from scratch in this newly rebuilt city. Um, so people saw, and this is like a work of the Spirit of God, people saw that the point of their lives was not just to be comfortable, but the point of their lives was to be fruitful. 
And, and people from the suburbs, this is no slight against the suburbs, but people outside of Jerusalem who already had homes that were built, who already had nice, comfortable lives, you know, some of them decided, this is comfortable, but I want to get in on what God's doing. And so, you know, honey, we're going to pack up and we're going to rebuild inside the city. Now, of course, this is not just like a, the way you and I would move from one city to the next, you know, for, for um, you know, job reasons or whatever. There's, there's lots of reasons for people to move. Um, but for these ones, they say, listen, God has made promises about that city. You know, God is going to work through that city to bless all cities. And so, you know, honey, let's get involved in that. Okay. And so they pack up and they move in and they rebuild. There's this, this hope for the city and they want to be part of it. And so they don't just contribute with, like, thoughts and prayers. Um, they don't just contribute with, like, financial giving. Those are good things. But they say, we want to contribute with our lives as well. We're going to move addresses to be part of what's going on. So they are less comfortable they could have been to play even a small role in the purpose of God for their generation. And they would, they would say, it's not just for their generation, it's for coming generations. They're investing in this city for the future good of the world. And so the title of, of the series of Nehemiah, our big, our big picture view, is that it's building towards our future. Like they're, they're working for the present, but they know this is good for the future as well. And, and likewise, as we are involved in obedience to God for the good of our generation, we also believe this is good for future generations as well. I had a, a, a conversation with um, this young, newly married couple um, over the week. And uh, they were living in Dublin for quite a while, um, involved in like a, a really healthy and vibrant uh, church community up there. Um, and then now they've moved to like rural Ireland. Um, and they are, like, investing in, um, like, a new and a small church plant. And they're, they're saying, they're really being honest and saying, you know, like, I, I miss big city life. This is kind of the opposite. This is moving from the big city into the suburbs. But they say, we miss big city life. We really miss our old church. It was really, like, mature. It was really developed. There was ministries and systems. And now there's, like, nine of us. And, and we miss that. But, but they're, you know, they have regular jobs and they're just, they're, as far as I know, they're not in any kind of even formal leadership in the church. But they're like, you know what? We just believe in it. And so we're willing to just invest in this. So they, they left something comfortable to be part of what they believe God is doing in the establishment of this, this new church plant in rural Ireland. So they're making sacrifices, but they're glad to do it for the good of this generation and future generations in that community. And, you know, I, I, I was like, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Because it feels like not just, yes, just yesterday, but I know it wasn't, when, like, when, when we were that church. When, when Calvary Cork was just, like, this, like, struggling, faltering, um, like, pity party, it felt like, uh, in, those, in those early years. Um, you know, October 2005, just like this Bible study in my front room, you know? And we had no kids' ministry, no men's ministry, no women's ministry, no college ministry, no community groups, no discipleship groups, no, like, addiction recovery group, just, like, some young guy teaching the Bible badly. And, um, and people just, like, had mercy and pity and were like, you know, they, they need help. <laughs> and people came, um, uh, in order, I believe, like to be part of what they saw that God, God was doing. And so not that we've arrived, certainly Calvary Cork, we've not arrived. There's, there's room for more and there's, there's plans for the future. But I'm happy to be part of a church that, like, that has all of those things and, and more. And then I, I want to say this is not just like a church thing as well. I think, I think verse 2 has application um, for any of you who see a need and rather than rolling your eyes you roll up your sleeves and you say you know like they need help like people need to live in that rebuilt city or you know that poor guy he needs someone to preach to or, <laughs> or um you know like there, there, there's that need and so we don't just be like ah oh, you know sure whatever but it's like hey how can I be involved how can I help and so in verse two it says and the people blessed 
all those that willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. And so like, like for you, like thank you to everyone who chooses to leave a place of comfort to willingly volunteer to be personally involved in the enriching of others and the strengthening of God's purpose for weakened communities and for weakened um, individuals. So like hear this from scripture, hear this from God, like we bless you. Like we are glad that there's the comfortable option um, or there's the, the right option. There's the comfortable or there's the fruitful option. And for making those uncomfortable steps towards fruitfulness and blessing not yourself but somebody else, like we, we bless you. We're so glad. We wouldn't exist if it weren't for you. And I believe that, that God is doing wonderful, great things through people whose names we have a hard time pronouncing, but who made choices and played a part in God's role for that nation and then now all nations. So we see that um, God sees what's going on here and, and then he does not forget it. And, and he makes sure that these people get their names recorded forever. People who chose fruitfulness over comfort, well, they get their names in the Bible. <laughs> and here's some of, well, and these are the chiefs of the provinces who lived in Jerusalem. And then we see that there's the list. I don't know. Joed, Koliah, Messiah, Malchijah, Zabadee, Jedithum. Anyway, that's chapter 11, okay? <laughs> so as much as I want to, yeah, we honor them. But yet, I couldn't be bothered reading their names. But God put them there, and I, I encourage you to read them on your own <laughs> in the future, because we only have so much, so much time. But as we see, you know, that God forgets them not. He sees just like this, this move, this move from comfort towards fruitfulness, and he says, you know, that's so good. And I want to make sure that, that from in years to come, that people are remembering that they made that choice. They willingly offered to do that. And so we remember, or we see that, can I get the thesis statement up there? Um, so the thesis, anyway, is that God does not forget the work of his people. Um, so they made a sacrifice, he sees, he remembers. God forgets us not. And then another thing that we can learn from that, that list of names that I picked a few um, random ones from, um, is that individuals matter to God, um, even if they aren't upfront and famous. Um, again, I, I probably shot myself in the foot by not reading all their names, but I'm not going to, and you can read it later on. But um, these people, like, they, they didn't start the initiatives. These aren't the Ezra's or the Nehemiah's or the Moseses, or even the Joshua's. Um, again, their names are easy to skip, but God sees what they did, and God is pleased with it. Um, I, I wonder, I think that maybe 2018 is probably, it's like the easiest time in the world to, to have 15 minutes of fame. Um, you know, we all carry, um, like, you know, high def most of us carry high definition cameras in our pockets, you know, and we could take a picture of ourselves at any moment and we could, we could get fame or notoriety and there's always the hope, you know, maybe I'll go viral, maybe I'll be famous. Like, like God here is um, interested in people who are not aspiring for greatness, nor fame, nor recognition, people that don't mind being involved in, in lesser things. You know, the prophet Zechariah, who is a contemporary of Nehemiah, you know, he says in Zechariah 4.10, you know, that we should not despise the day of small things. Some translations say small beginnings, but I kind of like the idea of small things. Small beginnings implies, well, it starts out small, then it gets great. Small things might mean that we always serve in small, obscure ways. And it says, blessed are those who are not stumbled or who, who, um, who don't despise the day of small things. There's ways to serve a great God by doing small things. Their names are recorded because their lives mattered. They're people with names, people who matter to God. Um, and again, they matter to God even if we can't pronounce their names. Zabdiel, Shemaiah, Azakram, Hashabiah. So the ability to pronounce a person's name or not does not 
directly relates to the value that God puts on a person. Remember 14 years ago, moving to Ireland and meeting people named Saibhan and um, <laughs> Owain and thinking, I can't even pronounce these names. But then I was just to learn how much the, the Lord um, cares for people whose names are hard to pronounce. And forgive me if that's insensitive. I'm sorry, I'm just, that's me as a, as a dumb foreigner. Um, so, um, yeah, so your work might be done, might be a small thing, um, a support role, a, a background character. Uh, you might even be done anonymously, but just great news. Like, your work is not anonymous to God. Um, the Lord remembers, let's look at Hebrews 6.10, hopefully. Hebrews 6.10 the Lord remembers every labor done in love, and nothing with him is forgotten. So God does not forget the works of his people. God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. Essentially, it says, you know, God does not forget the work of his people. And that's, that's good news. You know, I recommend that that's a verse that you memorize or that you type out and keep it in your back pocket. Um, when, there's, when there's a lack of applause in your life or when there's a lack of um, even just the, the basic acknowledgement of someone saying thanks, um, it's nice to know that God is not unjust to overlook the work of love that we've shown and laboring for his name by serving the saints. You know, maybe you've gone to like... Um, a fundraiser or like a band competition and they have those um, like applause meters. Have you seen them? And you know, the more people clap, like the higher the thing goes and then that's the winner. Like good news, guys. Great news. Like there's no applause meter in heaven. And, and the amount of applause that we get on earth does not like increase blessings that we'll receive um, one day. In, in fact, if we, if we take the words of Jesus seriously, sometimes it's the things that aren't noticed on earth that are most valued by God. So remember that God does not forget the work of his people. And secondly, people should not forget the work of their God. So chapter 11 is about God noticing the sacrifices that his people made um, for the establishing of, of the city of Jerusalem. And then the next bit is about people not forgetting the work of their God. Uh, chapter 12 just keeps on going with that list of names. And it goes all the way to verse 27. And that's where we're going to focus. And Hannah read this out for us, but here's, here's it again. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites... In all of their places, and they brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgiving, with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And they, they all gathered from the, the various um, uh, villages. Verse 30, they purified themselves, they purified the people, they purified the gates and the wall. And then it describes in verse 30 and following how uh, Nehemiah organizes all of these singers and these choirs that have all come from all the hinterlands and the suburbs. They've come together and he says, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide into two different groups, two choirs. He says, I'm going to lead one and my boy Ezra, he is going to lead the other one. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk all the way around Jerusalem I think some people believe that they walked on top of the walls themselves. They walk along the walls and they sing and they bring their cymbals and their lyres and their, their instruments and they, they praise the Lord all the way across the circumference of the city. And then it says, and they meet together in the house of God. So they kind of start, you know, t -t today we'd say like, okay, we'll meet at, at, at Penrose Key, okay? And, and you take the north side and we'll take the south side and we're going to like, march all the way through the city and we're going to meet at the gates of UCC. We're going to kind of encompass or encircle the city and then meet together to, to praise together. And that's, that's what they did. They, they marched along the newly rebuilt wall and they met together in the temple of God. So they, they are acknowledging God has done something great. Let's, let's thank him 
for it. And remember, when did the wall get finished? It got finished in chapter 6. And, and I remember even like um, teaching it and preaching on that Sunday and then being kind of surprised that like after all that buildup, the completion of the wall is described in two verses. So we finished the wall. We finished it in 52 days. And then the very next verse after that is like, and Sanbala and Tobiah won't stop giving me hassle. So here's how I dealt with that. So it, it, it complete, chapter 6 is a chapter full of conflict. It's full of um, crisis after crisis and drama and attack and opposition. And then Nehemiah, working through that, finishes the wall, but the opposition doesn't stop. And so it only gets two verses, and you kind of just see him like, okay, it's finished. Okay, now what next? And then he deals with what's ever next. You know, there's just kind of this ongoing busyness of, of life. You know, people call it like the tyranny of the urgent. Um, there always is something that's waiting for you. As soon as we finish one job, the next job is, is already upon you. Um, that there's the next person knocking at the door, or there's the next email. You know, it's such a, a great thing to, to reply to every email in your inbox. And for me, it lasts like an hour, and then more come in. And it's like, ugh. So Nehemiah finished this, and then just continued on. There's more things to be done. But now, six chapters later, we're not sure the exact amount of time that took place afterwards. It's been at least a few weeks. He's like, hang on a second. God did something great. The wall is finished, and we haven't even properly thanked him for it. And so what they do, in, in the midst of the new progress, in the midst of new people moving, in the midst of new homes being built, you know, with new businesses or there's urban renewal taking place, Nehemiah says, like, before we go any further, we need to stop and deliberately thank God for this out loud and in public. You know, and, and again, I'm sure Nehemiah said, thanks, God. Like, he's good for those quick shotgun prayers. Like, I'm sure he was like, thank you, Lord. Anyway, what's next? But he's like, that's not good enough. Like, God answered all of our prayers. God used so many people. So let's publicly get together to thank him, like, really loudly. You know, this, this reminds me of the passage in um, Luke chapter 17, which perhaps we're familiar with. I, I encourage you to, to read the account um, later on. But essentially, Jesus finds a group of, of, of lepers, these people that were um, incurable um, in the day. And, and with a word, he cures them of their skin disease. He cleanses them from their ritual impurity and from the life of isolation that they lived. He heals them, and they all run off to celebrate. And one comes back and says, thank you. And Jesus kind of marvels and is like, you know, didn't I heal ten of you? Like, where, where's the rest? Anyway, you can, you can check out the story for yourself. But we see there's this principle of Jesus does something Everyone benefits, and 10% come back to consciously articulate gratitude. I'm sure the other nine felt thankful, but as far as consciously vocalizing it, only one did. So the lepers were all healed by Jesus, but one came back to say thank you. Uh, Nehemiah says, like, I want to come back to say thank you. Like, there's more to be done. There always is. But he says, I want to plan a time of gratitude, thankfulness, and dedication to say, God, everyone was saying this was impossible, but we did it. We did it with your help. So we want to say thank you. So again, those spontaneous short prayers, like they're good. Feeling grateful, that's good. But from time to time, it's good to have like planned, deliberate elaborate thanksgiving ceremonies. Um, so again, they're, they're, that's what they do. He gets everyone together. There's the, he gets the band together, and he's like, okay, practice these songs of thanksgiving, you know? I want you to have, you know, like, how many, how many different ways can you say thank you, Lord? Okay, cool. Put them all together in a song. I want, like, a thankfulness choir, and, and I don't want it to just be localized. I don't want anyone to miss this, because if we just go, like, you know, clockwise, like, what if somebody misses it? No, we'll surround the city. So all the inhabitants, they're bound to hear us. And they're bound to, to just acknowledge that, wow, God is at work. So it's not just like some parade. It's this mobile praise choir. You know, there's a, a passage in um, 
Psalm 48 um, that it's not about this, but it makes me think of this. It says, walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this God, our God, forever and ever, he will guide us forever. And so this has got to be so like powerful for Nehemiah. In chapter 2, he came and he visited Jerusalem under the cover of darkness. And it says that he walked around the gates. He saw the, built, the, the crumbled down walls for himself. And then afterwards, then he started the process of rebuilding them. And then now, as he's walking on top of them, he's thinking, wow, God, I remember, you know, three months ago, this was just rubble. But Lord, you have done the impossible. You used people, you used a cupbearer to organize this rebuilding process. He says, I'm not an engineer, I'm not an urban planner, but God, you used me. And then for all the choir singers, how much they have felt as well. Those are the ones that lived in the area for their whole lives, perhaps. They're the ones that got so used to the idea of, yeah, the walls are broken down. Yeah, the gates are burned with fire. That's just how things are. It will never change. And then now there they are recruited into the choir to sing, thank you, God, for changing this. So there's emotions from Nehemiah. There's emotions from the choir. And then circling back to Nehemiah, remember like the taunts and the opposition that he got from the neighbors, Sanballat, Tobiah, the other ones. Do you remember one of them said, you know, even if you rebuild these walls, they're going to be so frail that even if a fox jumped on them, that, that it's going to crumble. Do you remember that? Well, anyway, now he's like, well, I'm marching on it with a choir saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yahweh. But thank you, Lord, for, for, for doing this. And the choir is marching upon what you thought not even a fox could stand upon. And so he's just joyful and he's loud in their singing. We, we'll have a few more of those verses. Uh, verse 34 um, or rather verse, um, verse 40. So both of those choirs gave thanks and they, they met together. They, they stood in the house of God, I and the officials with me. Uh, jump down to verse 43. And then once they arrived in the temple, it says, they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God has made them rejoice with great joy. And the women and men also rejoiced. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. There was great sacrifices that was offered, and there was great rejoicing. And, and they, were, they were loud. You know, they, they couldn't keep quiet. I, I like how it says that the joy from Jerusalem was heard far away. Maybe not even the individual lyrics. Maybe they couldn't make out the actual words, but they were like, sounds like there's really joyful people there. Like, they're excited about, about something. You know, if you live in the vicinity of Turner's Cross, like maybe you know what it's like to hear like the sound of joy. Well, anyway, the neighbors of Jerusalem were like, you know, it sounds like they're really excited about something. Maybe their God did something worth celebrating. And they're like, yes, yes, he did. And they didn't want noise dampening curtains. <laughs> they're like, it's okay if there's an echo. We are thankful for what God has done. So they're loud. They couldn't keep quiet. Um... You know, Psalm 30 says that weeping might last for the night, but shouts of joy come in the morning. And Nehemiah has been one who's been through hard times. The citizens of Jerusalem, they've been through like a generation of hard times. And now shouts of joy have come in the morning. And so kind of circling back, um, I love what happens here. I love this idea of them splitting up and then circling what God has done and thanking him for it. God has allowed them to rebuild their destroyed and disgraced city. And so they circle it. And what does it mean to circle something? Like, um, I, I wish that I could, like, show you my Bible. And, and like, I, when I read the Bible, like, when there's, like, things that are just, like, important, like, I, I, I circle it. I can't pass my Bible around because I'm, I'm using it at the moment, so you'll have to trust me. Maybe there's some other circlers, or maybe there's highlighters here. But if you, you circle something because it matters, you want to draw attention to it, you want to make sure that you notice it, and perhaps other people notice it as well. Um, maybe, 
Of course, I didn't upload that right either. But um, <laughs> Adam, you ever like scroll through YouTube and you see all the um, the um, like previews? Um, there's always like a red circle on certain things for some reason. It's it's a it's a clickbait thing because your eye is drawn to a circle, a red circle. You're like, whatever that is, that's important. And then you click it. it turns out it's not important. So just you fell for it. Um, but so you circle things that are important, and they circled Jerusalem. And so I want to, I want to like ask you, what's worth circling? What would you circle in your life? So I know that um, we're, we're in a new year, but like in 2017, in, in the months of 2018, like what would you circle? What would you draw a circle around and say, that's something that I don't want to forget. That's something that I believe God has worked in in the world, in our church, for you? What's something that you'd circle and say, I don't want to forget that. God has been at work in that circle. You know, Dave Shaw um, wrote a song for us um, called What Comes Next, and some of those lines kind of recounting on what God has done. He's circling certain acts of God in the life of our church. God, you have weathered all of our fears and doubts. You've heard us when our hearts have cried out. Through tragedies of pain and loss, our Father never has abandoned us. So we circle that. We've seen children born and born again. From the river rise again, baptisms. We've seen leaders raised to shepherd us and teach the mercies of the wondrous cross. And so we circle that. We say, yeah, God, you've, you've raised up leaders. God, we get to hear the good news of the gospel again and again. And we circle that. So there's things that we should just circle. Uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful. As, you know, I know that um, uh, just a couple days ago, um, Kean Miller was born to the, the Miller family. That's a good thing. You circle that. I know that a few days ago, it was uh, Ryan Sexton's birthday. You know, we remember his, his birth and just the, the long, drawn-out, you know, premature waters breaking and and the way that we prayed that you know that God would just keep that baby uh, in the womb for as long as possible and and you know his his first birthday was just a couple days ago like we just want to circle that and you know there's a variety of of things that we could point to some some with like great happy endings some with ongoing challenges too we could say you know there's been suffering but but God has held me fast um, in the midst of that Uh, you know it's like I almost died a couple months ago um, hit by a car in a hospital and was in a Zimmer frame and then had a cane and and you know people ask oh how are you doing and the common answer that I give is that you know to be honest like I actually feel so recovered that like I don't even think about it anymore like it's 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 um it's so much like this weird thing that happens that days go by without me even remembering it but I'm thinking now maybe well, well, thank you. I'm thinking, but maybe I should remember it more. Maybe there should be this consciousness of, of thinking, wow, like every time I put on my socks, like I had to have other people put on my socks, you know, and, and now I'm able to like bend down and do it myself. There's these things that I want to, to, to circle, to remember them and be, and be glad about them just as much as they circled Jerusalem you know, with their praise choir saying, thank you, God, for this. So in chapter 11... We see people that served God quietly. Like they didn't insist. They didn't work their way out front and say, you know, name the book after me. (laughs) I want to be the famous one. Move over, Nehemiah. It's all about me. Adonijah, you know. Um, Like it's about me. Like they're totally fine to just serve God quietly in obscurity. And I think God calls us to, to serve God quietly and in obscurity. But in chapter 12, we see people serving God and praising God loudly. So, so wouldn't it be great if we could be a community of people that are happy to serve God quietly and praise God loudly? Um, and so we, we see that, and I just, I love, I guess, this image. And, and I want, you know what, like, guys, you're going to have a chance to do that. <laughs> you're going to have a chance to praise God loudly. And so we're going to sing some songs, and then uh, Sheena's going to, like, pause and we're going to have a time when, when you're going to be like invited to, to vocalize what you'd want to put a circle around. To say, thank you God for... And then just say a sentence. Say a word or two. We're not looking for long... Like, I already preached the sermon. We don't need more sermons. But, but we're looking for like expressions of gratitude for specific things. 
So you're going to have a chance to be able to do that. So, so think about that. What will I circle? What, what am I going to encircle? And what will I publicly thank God for? They thank God for the city that was in ruins and in disgrace, but God brought it to a place of stability and safety. Um, what will you thank God for? And so as we kind of conclude, as we think about those people that came and volunteered to serve in obscurity, just want to point you towards Jesus as the ultimate volunteer with the capital V. Jesus is the ultimate one who chose to leave a place of comfort, to willingly volunteer, to be personally involved with the enriching and the strengthening of the purpose of God amongst communities and individuals. Uh, Jesus is the one who records our names. He makes sure that every name that is his is written down. Not in an obscure chapter in Nehemiah 10 and 11 and 12, but in the Lamb's book of life. And so believer, your name is written in his book. And he does not look to our works. He looks to our faith. He says that he who believes in me shall live even though they die. We started the sermon by, by thinking about the list of those that, um, that signed up for that trip on the Titanic. And there was 2,223 that signed up for it. And that's one list. There's another shorter list of those that survived, 706. And wouldn't you agree that that list is what matters? The survivor's list? But, but Jesus is the one who puts the believer on his list and that is the one that truly ultimately matters. So Jesus is the ultimate volunteer. He's the one who records our names. And he is the one that we thank for his work for us. We march and we thank. We consciously call to mind that he is for us, that he loves you, and that he's working in and amongst us. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to divide in groups and go march. No. Um, <laughs> We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stand still and we're going to sing. We're gonna, we can, you can march in place if you like. And be thinking, what would I circle? And, and how will I thank him out loud in a way that can encourage the rest of my church? So let's pray. So Lord, we thank you for that, um, that list of names. And uh, the few paragraphs that tell us what they did and why they're there for. Um, but Lord, I pray that yeah, your word would have its intended purpose. That it would um, yeah, bring, bring hope where there's discouragement. Would bring strength where there's weakness. Would bring, here's the thing, Lord, would bring gratitude where there's complacency. Help us to obey Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. I pray that we'd be those that are consciously remembering your benefits. Lord, you are the one who remembers his people. Help us to be those that remember our God. In Jesus' name, amen.